Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Your computer's not broken. I'm playing you some music. This is Francois Hardy from 1971, I think. Just sort of sunny, happy French pop music. You must you speak French, I'm not gonna understand the words, but playing that, I'm gonna yak at you for a minute while the room is filling up. I can see y'all starting to come in. As we're doing that, why don't we go ahead and just do something we do always at these Communications Network gatherings online. Uh, if you take your finger or your cursor, whatever you got, go ahead and look down there. Just hover down towards the bottom of your screen, and what should pop up is a little bar. On that bar, you should see a thought bubble, kind of looks like something out of a comic book that says chat. Tom's already jumped in there because Tom knows the drill. Hey, Tom. If you would, make sure you uh, note that you're setting it to all panelists and attendees. So just make sure you're talking to everybody. Hey, Nick, how are you? And I'm just going to say hi. It's Sean. If you'll add your name, your organization, where you're from. If you were with us yesterday, it's going to sound like Groundhog Day because we just did this. Uh, but if you're new to the network or you haven't been with us before, or at least not recently, just go ahead and throw your names in there. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, Robin, Allison, Catherine, Amanda, Nat. Oh boy, you guys are going too fast. Okay, so part of the aim of what we're going to do while we're together is we're obviously all going to pay attention to what Matt has to say. He'll be with us in just a hot minute. But this is also an opportunity for us to all gather. As you can see, just from scrolling through this chat, hey, Jose, how are you? Karen, Katie, uh, Jennifer, Brooke, how are you? Amanda, Georgia. Okay, I got to stop because you guys are going too fast again. You should also use this as an opportunity to say hello to one another. Uh, the real power of networks is being able to have uh, other folks available to you so that if you have a question, uh, maybe not even related to the topic at hand, or you have something that you want to share, by all means, just go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, also, if you've been with us before, you know this, our colleague Carrie Klein is in the chat. She's going to be taking notes, but she'll be sharing links that are relevant to you in here. So if you need them, you'll see them in just a quick minute. And if you're one of those good souls who gets on Twitter, manages a couple screens at the same time, well, then what you're going to want to do is use the hashtag ComNetLive, that's C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. -E, and we will be taking live notes on Twitter as well. Yeah, we'll be screenshotting some of the slides that Nat's going to share with us. So you can avail yourselves of that either in real time or go back and check it out on Twitter a little bit later. There's a Twitter highlight thing where you can kind of capture it all. And we will share out the video. We always do this recording of this, as well as the live notes that Carrie's going to make, uh, probably within the next, well, I guess it's Friday. So we'll do it as quickly as we can, but certainly by Monday, you'll be able to see all of that on comnetwork.org. And the last thing, just props to my colleague and partner in crime, Tristan Mahabir. Uh, he's running the slide deck, at least for me. I think Matt's going to run his own deck. But, but T, if you go ahead and just go forward, I'm going to flag a couple things for y'all. Again, if you were with us yesterday, hey, who else is here? Whitney, Casey, Caroline, hey, everybody, from all over the country. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and Carrie is already tossing in some of the stuff that I'm talking about, so she's gotten ahead of me. This is the Communications Network Crisis. I'm going to turn our good friend Francois down a little bit. This is the Crisis Communications Triage Kit that we've created. This is open source. It was a collaborative document, or is a collaborative document, and you are welcome to it. Share it far and wide if you'd like. Uh, we recently, if you've seen this, or maybe it was about a week ago that you saw it, it's been entirely updated. So we just shifted all the information design, thanks to the good folks at Jay Sherman Studio from Boston who donated their time to make this a little bit easier for y'all to find and navigate stuff. And then the team at Hathaway Communications, Spitfire, Defy, uh, a bunch of students at George Washington University all pitched in to make sure that what we were giving you was credible, good, relevant information. Uh, so help yourselves to that. And then related to that, there's also a Google Sheet that shares a lot of the products, communications things that you have made, whether that's an event cancellation or maybe a note to a grantee or a note to folks that you're serving in the community. Uh, you are welcome to help yourselves to those things. And, and the rule is, if you find it in there, plagiarism is it's not plagiarism right now because we're still in kind of an emergency situation. So you can go ahead and grab something someone else wrote, borrow from it. Uh, and uh, we, nobody's telling on anybody else. It's, it's an extraordinary circumstance. So people are putting it in there fully knowing that you may very well just borrow that language, block, stock, and barrel, and swap out a few words, add your name in, whatever it might be. All right, Mr. T, if you will go ahead. Uh, I'm going to do this really quickly. Uh, if you're part of the network or you're a network member, you've heard us talk about this. I think I even said it from the stage when we were back at ComNet in Austin, which feels like dog years ago. But circles. Uh, the conceit behind this is pretty simple. Uh, we are going to be building communities of practice or brain trusts 
for folks working on uh, based on either the issues that your organization focuses on. So imagine you're doing health, like you work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It might be helpful for you to be talking to folks at, say, the Colorado Trust or the California Endowment. And maybe you already do that, but specifically we want to, to connect to people who do communications for these organizations. So we're going to connect you either by the issue area your organization focuses on or the role that you play within your department. So maybe you're the VP or the director or whatever your title may be. We're going to pull together folks who have uh, different uh, have similar jobs, but in different organizations. So that's coming within the next couple of weeks. And Deborah is not digging the Francois Hardy. All right, I'll turn it off, my friend. Uh, let's, <laughs> Nat's laughing. You can't see him, but he's enjoying the fact that I'm, I'm hearing it from you all. Uh, Tristan, if you go ahead, please. Uh, this is the other thing we wanted to show you. If you are interested in seeing any of the previous virtual roundtables or what we have coming up, all on comnetwork.org. You can find it. So just recently, we've had leadership communications with Joanne Krell from Defy Communications, Kristen Grimm did Crisis Comms 101 with us. She's from Spitfire. Uh, just yesterday, Doug Hadaway and the team had read through the entire CDC Crisis Comms manual. Uh, that's up online if you want to watch it. We've had a couple of briefings now with one of the world's leading epidemiologists and infectious disease docs, a gentleman named Dr. Richard Wenzel. He'll be back with us next week, but you can watch those if you'd like, and there's live notes available for each of those sessions. Mr. Teach, you'll go forward. Other thing I want to flag for you, good folks at IDEO, again, forgive me if you were with us yesterday, you've already heard this, IDEO is partnering with the network to make designers and creatives available to nonprofits and folks who work in community foundations. So if you're the Gates Foundation, or WJF, or MacArthur, this isn't for you, but if you're a nonprofit, World Wildlife Fund, so what have you, they want to help you uh, with some design work to help you get the word out about COVID-19. So it's not to redesign your website or to do some fundraising appeal, but specifically to help people get the word out about COVID-19. IDEO is willing to do that and Carrie either will or just has put in the link in the chat box so you can find that. But I think it's IDEO, openideo.in backslash signal boost. You can also find that on commentbook.org. All right, Mr. T, if you'll go forward. Another thing we just want to flag for you so you're aware, chances are you saw this in the invitation or the reminder that we sent out this morning, an op-ed that we put out in the Chronicle Philanthropy, pretty simple premise. Uh, I wish the title was a little bit different. The premise is this, it's important for all of us in the foundation and nonprofit space to be amplifying and sharing the messages coming out of CDC, the NIH, specifically the Infectious Disease Center there run by Anthony Fauci and or your local Department of Health, presumably if it's doing the right thing right now. That may not be the case in certain states, but, but certainly anything you can help to, to get the word out from CDC and NIH is going to be incredibly effective. Uh, it is just is such a crowded information space. You just never know where someone's going to end up encountering some information that may be as persuasive to them. And we all have a, quite a bit of stature and standing within this sector. And so uh, there's a lot of data out there that says we are trusted voices. We should use them to be helpful. Uh, Mr. T, if you'll go forward. Uh, I was going to be a little bit cutesy with you all. We didn't get the video, but we took a couple screenshots from you. What that's going to look like, if you're able to share the signal, whether it's sharing an email or maybe posting just a link to CDC's coronavirus.gov page on your website, it's going to look like Lord of the Rings. You remember the final movie, Return of the King? Uh, the signal, uh, what was it called? The lighting of the beacons, where they, one of the hobbits snuck up, lit the fire, and then fire just spread across the mountains. It's actually a really cool video on YouTube, uh, or maybe you remember that from the movie, but that's what the signal boost ought to look like. Everybody lighten the beacon. It's the same exact message. It should be coming from you and your words, but it's boosting the signals coming out of CDC and NIH. All right, so that's me being cutesy. Let's go forward. A couple more quick things. Uh, we created a listserv. Just so everybody's aware of this, maybe you've already seen it. I think there's about almost 600 of us who are now part of this. There's a list serve that's available specifically to help people share information. And just so grateful to everybody being so kind and generous uh, and answering each other's questions and passing information back and forth. So if you're not part of that, by all means, it's free and open to everybody. It's just uh, something we were able to pull together. And so grateful to everybody who's been participating there. Mr. T, if you'll go forward. Uh, you all, maybe if you've been with us for the last couple of things, you've heard me say I come from a family of docs. I'm gonna go ahead and, and embarrass the hell out of my baby sister. Uh, I know her as Easy, that's the nickname I gave her, but uh, that is Dr. Rebecca Gibbons Potfe. Uh, she is a pulmonologist, she is working down in Richmond. And uh, uh, I would hope that if you're not already thinking about staying home, maybe skipping some of the things that you were open to do, I, I know some folks are still wandering out and about. If we're friends, do me a solid, stay home. I'm scared, I won't use the bad word. Uh, for this person who is in a hospital right now uh, in Richmond, Virginia, 
and supplies there ran out the other day. So uh, anything you can do to help the first responders, chances are you have a friend or you know somebody or heck, just do it for easy. She's an amazing person. We're all very proud of her and we love her. So do what you can. Uh, final thing, just to flag for you, and I'll tell you this again at the bottom of the hour. Uh, next week, we will be back with Dr. Wenzel, who was uh, one of my sister's mentors in med school. Uh, and then Chuck Babington, the former uh, chief AP writer, uh, is going to be with us to talk about how to make sure you're writing really tight and clean because people aren't reading much in this moment. They just aren't. Uh, with that, I think I get to hand off to my good friend, Nat Kendall Taylor, who's just one of the smartest folks I know. Chances are you've had a chance to meet Nat either at ComNet or one of our previous webinars, but you are in for a treat. Uh, why don't I stop yakking and let him have at it? And oh, uh, JC, to answer your question, how do you get added to the listserv? You just uh, look at the email we just sent you and you should see a link. You can just go there uh, or Carrie will maybe add it to the chat for you in just a quick minute. All right, Nat. All yours. Well, thank you very much. And Sean, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? We're good. I can see your screen, my friend. All right, great. And you can see me. Yes, I can. Okay, good. And you can hear me, obviously. Yes, and that's why I am now going to go on mute. It sounds good. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say um, hello to everyone who's on. I think there's about 250 of you on. Um, and just hope that everyone's hanging in and doing okay there. Um, and to first of all, thank everyone who's on this call. I know people have a lot going on, both professionally um, and personally. And and just want to just say thank you for for spending a little bit of your time on Friday with uh, with Sean and me as I, I take you through some stuff. And also to say thank you to to Sean, Tristan, and the rest of the Comnet team for for having me on. This is a great opportunity to do something that I absolutely love to do, which is talk about framing and and why it matters, uh, which I have to say feels particularly important, even though I may be biased um, in the current situation, in the current time that we're in. Uh, and I have one and only one goal for the rest of our time here today, which is to try to be helpful, to try to take some, some stuff that, that um, my team has been doing and to bring it all to you in a way that, that helps even if in some small way with things that you're struggling with and working on and trying to, trying to make happen. Um, and I think the, the, the goal to be helpful is normally what drives and motivates me, but I just have to say that over the last four weeks that um, that desire to be helpful has kind of been turned up all the way to 11. Uh, and I hope I, can, I hope I can do some of that on this call. Um, so what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do is uh, quickly reset us on a, on a common foundational understanding of what framing means, such that we can all be working from the same definition, given the fact that framing is one of these concepts that has been kind of become so ubiquitously used that um, I fear it has lost any and all meaning that it ever once had. So we'll just kind of reset really quick. I will uh, next, I'll move on to argue about why, um, to make an argument about why, and I don't think this is gonna be a hard argument to make given who's on this call, why framing is so important right now um, in our current context, but, but of equal, if not greater importance um, as we move forward into the next phases of, of this situation, of this crisis. And then I'll spend most of my time taking you through six ideas uh, that I think are really important, um, framing ideas for us to bring to our work. And I wanna start off by caveating the fact that, that these, are not, um, these are not unique ideas, they're not new ideas. There's lots of folks who are, who are using these, these frames and this way of positioning issues. A lot of people on this call actually, and, and really what I'm gonna do is try to underline, kind of bring them together and underline their importance, but also hopefully appeal to you all about the significance, the power of us coming together around these ideas and advancing them uh, collectively and how important um, that can be. Uh, I should also say that I have another, I, have a, I believe I have a couple of Frameworks colleagues on the line and a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today um, is part of a, a COVID newsletter that we launched about two weeks ago. And so if people are, if, if you all do find anything interesting in this presentation, uh, maybe I think my colleague Jess and my colleague Tamson are both on. If you could just, uh, Jess or Tamson, just link people to the, to the place on our website that, where they can sign up for the newsletter, that would be great. And here we go. So when, when I talk about framing for the next uh, 40 minutes, um, this is really what I mean. So, so framing in terms of the way that I define it is really about the choices, large and small, that we make and how we present our information, um, whether that's the particular pronouns that we use, um, how we present data, the values that we endorse, the metaphors that we advance, um, how those choices and how we present information have effects on how people think, how they feel, 
and of great importance these days how they act, uh, what they are or are not willing to do as a result of the information uh, packaged in frames that we present to them. So, so kind of variations in how we present our information and how those variations have um, sometimes significant effects on how people perceive our information and how they behave as a result. Uh, and a, just a quick example of this, uh, kind of a, a seminal example, um, in, a, in a study in 2004, Snyderman and uh, presented a sample of people with two different ways of framing the same information. So half of the sample got the, this idea of, uh, given the importance of free speech, would you favor allowing a hate group to hold a political rally? Um, the other half of the sample got the same information, except with a minor framing shift. So instead of the importance of free speech, the second uh, group got the risk of violence. And then they measured people's endorsement, their willingness to allow this, this hate group to hold the political rally. So when presented in the first way, with the frame of free speech, a full 85% of those people were supportive, were endorsive um, of, of allowing this thing to happen. But when the frame shift, the, shifted the, the results, uh, the level of support drops by, by more than half. So and the only thing that's different there is the way in which that information is being presented. And that, in essence, is what we mean when we talk about framing. So those of you who know me know that I, I love a good metaphor. Um, and I've started to think about framing as, as a key, um, as a way that we can um, unlock new conversations, um, open up space for new ways of thinking, create new ways for people to see problems, and importantly, to create new avenues that people can reach support for important solutions, or ways that conversations can be locked up tight um, kind of thinking shut down, messages rejected. So throughout the course of the, the webinar here, um, I'll probably be using this metaphor a little bit, but I think it's really important to think about frames, not as necessarily the door that we walk through or what we push through that door, but rather this, this opening function, this opening mechanism that, that the way that we position our messages can have in terms of how people walk through that door. Um, and, and I think this is, again, probably common sense to most people on the phone. Um, and, and I'm, again, probably biased in that I do framing work and have done so for, for almost 15 years. Uh, but I really do believe, uh, looking past that bias, that framing is incredibly important right now. And I'll just give you a few examples that by this point, some of these are probably a, a bit hackneyed and, and cliched uh, of where we can see this. So first of all, when um, when COVID was initially, or maybe remains framed as the Chinese virus, uh, there are some pretty strong framing effects of, of that positioning, right? So it creates fear of the other, uh, it creates a kind of isolationist nationalism, and um, I think we could argue that it creates and has created a sense of kind of xenophobia and racism, particularly against um, uh, individuals of, of Asian descent. Uh, also, this phrase that you hear still to this day, but was pretty heavy about two weeks ago, um, or three weeks ago, this idea of draconian measures. And what that really does powerfully is it creates the sense that um, these measures that are being taken are an overreaction. It creates a resistance to information and a very powerful hesitancy to, to act. Um, another one that's a little bit more subtle is, is this frame that I'm seeing a lot, um, this idea of protecting or sacrificing for the most vulnerable. And I'll talk about this one um, at length as we go. But the idea here is that this creates a really powerful instant othering, a zero sum way of thinking about groups and resources, and a really powerful way of, um, of kind of reifying existing stigma and stereotypes against certain groups of, of people. So while framing matters a lot right now, um, it is not new. It is something that has mattered for a long time. We have been doing research on framing for, for a while, and I've chosen this example to just to really drive that home. Um, but also because it makes a point, uh, kind of hints at a point around vulnerability that I'm going to go back to um, uh, throughout the course of, of, of this presentation. So this is a framing experiment that we ran about five years ago now on children's issues, specifically around early childhood development and child mental health. This is a quantitative experiment. It's about 6,000 people randomly assigned to hear one of two different messages, which you see along the horizontal axis of the graph. So half of the sample reads a message that's framed through the value of future progress and social prosperity. They'd hear something like, it's important that we do a better job of supporting children because, and we wouldn't say it in quite a quite, a, quite as cliched a way as this, but children are our future, right? Their, their um, solid development, their, their health and learning are influential or instrumental to our ability to progress as a society. The other half receives the same information, but just with a different lead-in. The frame is different. So instead of 
Uh, what I just said, they would they would read about um, vulnerability, that it's important that we do a better job of supporting children because they are our most vulnerable citizens and they deserve our empathy, our compassion, and we must do better. And then everyone answers a set of questions that are designed to measure how supportive they are of a set of, of evidence-based policies. And when you run that analysis, uh, which looks at the differences in support based on which message you heard, you get this really clear, powerful finding. Um, so the Future Progress Social Prosperity message frame creates the strong statistically significant increase in people's support, whereas uh, the less good news is this vulnerability frame not only performs flat, not only is it statistically indistinguishable from zero, which is no message, but rather it makes people less willing to support the policies that are designed to support kids. Um, and the really interesting thing is that when we looked um, at all of the fields, kind of outward facing materials, websites, op-eds, um, mission statements, um, the value of vulnerability is, is, the, um, is the dominant frame in, in well over 90% of those materials. Uh, so kind of a, an unintended negative effect um, based on what in theory looks like a, a sound and reasonable argument, but what in practice ends up having a, a backfire, a boomerang, a detrimental effect. And so we're going to talk about this idea of vulnerability quite a bit later as it is one of the, the dominant frames, at least that I'm noticing um, in the current discourse. Uh, so now I'm going to, I'm going to take you through six ideas that, um, that, that I think are particularly important that um, my colleagues at, at Frameworks have been, have been working on um, and have been um, providing support to people, to our partners in the field to, to, to use and employ. And again, the idea here is not that these are new ideas. I know there are people, I know for a fact, based on who logged into this call, that there are people who are advancing these frames. And my role here is just to kind of bring them together, highlight them, but also to advocate for the importance of us all collectively advancing them out into the into the, the, the public discourse. Uh, and so the first one um, is that it is incredibly important right now uh, how we are talking about individuals and, and government, kind of the balance between our individualistic discourse and the way that we are communicating about government, and how critical getting this balance, uh, getting these frames right is. And so we've seen, um, and I'm gonna draw on quite a bit of, of existing research that Frameworks has done on public understandings of, of government and, and framing around government that when government is framed kind of um, unequivocally as broken, inept, and incapable, there's a very immediate and strong reaction to um, kind of viewing government as uh, not part of the solution, to kind of being supportive and endorsive of, of individual solutions, uh, to viewing privatization. So a lot of this work comes out of work that we've done with some folks that are on the phone um, around education and a sense of fatalism, that if government is so broken and up and incapable, there's really nothing that we can do to, um, to fix it, to improve it, because it is so large, monolithic, and intransigent. Um, also a sense, and we see a ton of this, I think particularly around um, public health workers kind of in clinical settings of these heroic acts of, uh, these individualistic heroic acts, and I think that while some of that is, is fine and great, and it's certainly true, um, a preponderance or an exclusive focus on heroic actions, actually the framing effect is that it lets government off the hook, right? It obscures the role that government has and needs to play in the current situation, and it makes people think that the, that the, the solution is really just individual decisions, better willpower, and, and more kind of self-sacrificing hero, uh, heroic actions. But when we can frame government in terms of being responsible, the importance of being held accountable, and the unique and necessary role that they play, we see a very different um, effect of those kind of frames. People's individualism is kind of tapered, uh, kind of tempered, or, or kind of balanced, and people actually demand that the government does the things that only the government can do and needs to do. So there's a, a set of recommendations around how to communicate about individuals and government that I think are really important. Um, and and I, I don't think they're incredibly hard to do in our communication. So the first is to make really clear calls for, for increased government action, but also to, to make strong and, and critical appeals to the responsibility of government to, to do these things and when there has been failures to call out, to call out those failures. Uh, the second is to explain, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about explanation, the unique role that government plays that neither individuals nor um, private corporations um, can play. To be specific about what government needs to do 
and also to be really specific about what it hasn't done. Um, so I don't mean in any of this that we need to be kind of Pollyanna-ish and, and rosy about, about government and its role and what it has done. Um, but I do think that there, there is a sense uh, that it needs to be kind of continually called to task. But also to give a sense, um, an efficacious sense that there are things that, 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 that need to be done that government can do, right? To not leave people with the idea that uh, government is, has, has done nothing but fail and can do nothing but continue to fail, but to give people a way of seeing that there is a positive direction that this can go in through different and better responses and action by the government. And I think this last one is, is hugely important, um, the importance of repetition. Uh, you all know this very well, but the single most, uh, the, the single strongest predictive factor in what people believe is, is how many times they've heard it, right? And so people have been hearing a lot about individual acts of, um, of uh, kind of heroic acts. And the, the answer is to give them equally robust discourse and frames around government responsibility. The second idea that I think is really important, which I've already hinted at a little bit, is to make sure that in our messages we are finding a balance between urgency, how dire and on fire the situation is, and it is, but also efficacy, the fact that there are things that can and need to be done that can remediate, can fix, can, um, can kind of get us to a different position. Uh, and so we've seen, and this is not just frameworks, there's a whole field of social psychology that, that studies this balance, that when messages are framed uh, kind of unequivocally around urgency and crisis, uh, people get very fatalistic and they, they disengage in powerful and, and immediate ways. But on the other hand, when messages are all kind of woo-woo, hopey, changey, solutions are everywhere, um, there, there's lack of engagement. Um, and in this case, if you come out with messages that are, are overly efficacious and aren't balanced, um, people will reject your message as being, as being kind of out of whack with, with where we are. Uh, but when you can present these balanced messages that, that set the urgency of the situation and kind of provide that grip and resonance that you need, but also uh, bring, bring solutions to the game, uh, people have greater perceptions of agency, that there are things that can be done. They are willing to engage in actions that are presented, um, and they're, they're more likely to, to perform those actions. So the what to do's here are to, and I realize this is not always possible in your communications, but where you have a solution, where there is one, bring it. Uh, make sure that that gets into your communications. Uh, not only to, to drop that solution and let it be, but to explain how it works and what it will do if, if, if implemented. Um, I think the tone really matters uh, on this idea of efficacy and urgency, uh, that we want to have a tone that um, communicates there are solutions and not just problems. Uh, and so the danger here is that we become overly solution focused. And I think that we need to kind of make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, we do need to connect with people's sense of how hard things are. Uh, and if we don't make that connection, I think there's a good chance of, of our messages being rejected. So don't forget the urgency part of this equation and go all towards solutions. But the idea is um, when you're creating communications to really seek that, that balance. The third idea um, is, and I, this is where the, the, the ideas about vulnerability will come in, to think very carefully about how we are positioning groups, um, particularly at-risk groups um, or groups that are being described as quote unquote vulnerable. So we've seen in a lot of work um, and, and uh, so much work that we have a, a very strong sense that this is what is going on in the current discourse, that when we frame issues as vulnerable, uh, when we frame groups as vulnerable, we immediately otherize them. Right, so it's never us that's vulnerable, it's always someone else. Um, and what this does uh, frequently is it reifies or, or kind of re-ingrains the existing stereotypes that we have um, against um, whatever the, the kind of quote unquote at-risk at group is. Um, another thing that we see a lot of now in terms of how groups are framed um, is this kind of saviors and victims discourse uh, that I think we fall into without meaning ill, but we, we fall into frequently. And with this, does is it's first of all I think incredibly patronizing um, and 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 stigmatizing against the the groups that fall into the the victim part of that construction, and it sets up a really strong zero sum mentality in which um, resources are uh, kind of uh, some people need to sacrifice and provide resources to to other people and any time that um, you've set up this kind of zero sum mentality, it's very easy for people to to check out and to not engage with those messages. And then another one that you see a lot of 
is these appeals to the worthiness of certain groups of people. You see a lot of this in terms of the way that people are talking about older, older adults, older people um, in the current discourse. And um, I am, I'm firmly um, in belief that anytime we establish worthiness as the construct, uh, we, we run into all kinds of problems. It invites us to evaluate um, who is worthy and, and who is not and who deserves and who doesn't deserve in a way that I think is, is, is pretty um, uniformly unproductive. So what we wanna do, and again, you see this happening in discourse and, and it, it just um, makes the framer in me very happy when, when you see communications going out with this is um, uh, rather than us and them, we want to, to talk about interconnection as strength, we want to talk about responsibility to all. Uh, we want to try to connect with common experiences, which is kind of the antithesis of what savior and victims framing does. Um, we want to appeal to this idea that everyone needs to step up and do the right thing, which you can see is quite different from, from kind of savior and victim framing. Um, and we want to advance the principle of targeted universalism. I'm not saying we would necessarily want to use that, those words. Um, but the idea that there are general principles and then there are groups for uh, for whom there are specific um, needs that need to be met rather than falling into this vulnerable groups, uh, vulnerable individuals trap. The fourth idea is around explanation, something that if you um, if you know frameworks uh, work, you'll be quite familiar with. Uh, but there's a lot of, of the opposite of explanation going on in the discourse, which is just description or 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 kind of more baldly uh, making recommendations. And we know uh, that when the message is, is kind of from the frame of do what we say, uh, there's a major risk that people will, will reject that message and will disengage from it. Uh, that when you tell people what to do without telling them why to do it and how it works, um, there's, a, there's a large risk that people will evaluate that in a way that leads them to, to distance themselves from whatever action is being advocated. And instead, if we can take a see how this works perspective, and this doesn't mean, you know, having a, a complex dissertation in each of your and all of your messages, but but explaining uh, to people how solutions work, what they do, um, that you can engage people in supporting those solutions, you create this sense of efficacy that there are things that we can do, and you get people to lean in and get and engage with messages in, in fundamentally different ways. So the, the what to do's here are um, to explain why the problems that we're talking about exist, not just to describe the problem or use some data that evidences it, but rather to peel back a little bit, um, a layer of the onion and make people, and I don't mean this in a patronizing way, make people smarter about how the, how the problem works and why it exists. Uh, to show what particular actions or solutions do to that problem, um, and I've got a little gif of a um, of a graphic that I saw from come out of a New Zealand group a couple of weeks ago that I think is just a phenomenally simple example of what I'm talking about in terms of explaining how um, what, what actions and solutions do. So I'll just let that play, hopefully for a second. Um, and it, I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can see it. Sean, can you see it? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, we shared this actually. This is wonderful. Okay, I think this is just it's amazing. Um, and it's a, it's, 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 it is explanation. It is quick. One run through of it takes about, I think, four or five seconds. Um, and it, it helps people understand um, what actions and solutions do. Um, I think there's also a, a need to, and this is a tough one, it's to expand the, the who, expand past um, the, the kind of hospitals and, and systems of healthcare to talk about who is involved in solutions so that people can begin to see a wider range of solutions as being appropriate and necessary. So that doesn't mean to stop talking about people in healthcare, but that just means to we need to broaden our lens and give people a, um, a bigger sense of who is involved in this situation and the solutions that are necessary. So this is kind of goes back to the to the op-ed that, um, that ComNet put out in, in the Chronicle two weeks ago, I think, Sean. Um, we which is something like that. a week yeah. ago. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, That's all good. Yeah, every day is Wednesday at 10:30 for me. It I've is lost Groundhog. Complete, it's Groundhog complete, Day. I know. Complete track of time here. Um, but I think that that point, that that piece, makes a really important point, which is framing is is also about what we don't say. Um, and I've got two particular two examples here that I think are are really interesting. So one of my colleagues on the phone um, is is uh, is in the UK, and um, we were kind of poised on the edge of 
of launching a campaign around childhood obesity in two London boroughs, which was really all around the idea of um, the way that some communities are flooded by unhealthy food choices. And there was some discussion about whether we should go ahead and, and roll out that campaign, uh, those messaging ideas in the current discourse. And um, it's pretty clear that, 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 that those ideas are, are wholly inappropriate in the current context where a lot of individuals are, are struggling to, um, to feed themselves and, and feed their families. Um, coming, coming out with messages about um, a flood of unhealthy options is really inappropriate. And so the decision was made to uh, to kind of put that project or put those messages on on pause, and the other one that I think is is much more complex, but 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 much more interesting as well, is this idea of of climate change. Um, I do think that there are obligations that we have and and openings that exist to communicate about climate change, particularly at the intersection of climate change and issues around. Um, uh, around the economy and, and how it will be kind of rebooted as we as we move forward. But at the same time, I think that there are messages, particularly around the way that we've seen positive um, environmental effects uh, in the, the abs as kind of the economy have, has been shut down that I think are, are really dangerous and uh, where people, uh, where climate change communicators are wise to abstain from participating in the discourse. Um, this is my last point, which is less a recommendation and, and more of an idea. And Sean and I were talking about this before everyone else got on, which is this idea that how we frame our issues now definitely matters for now, right? And it matters in terms of where resources go and how responses are coordinated and, and who gets what and, and, and kind of um, who does what. But the decisions that we're making now and how we frame our issues are also going to be of incredible consequence to where our issues go in the future. Um, and we know that when there are uh, times of, of flux, times of kind of crisis, like the one that we are in, these are times when, when kind of fundamental ideas or mindsets get recast or get reset. Now, whether that's going all the way back to the Great Depression and thinking about how that crisis was one in which we, we kind of emerged with very different ideas about government and government responsibility and participation and, and role in markets. Um, in in kind of what most people would argue is a is a positive emergence from a from a time of great great strife and, and flux, or whether we're talking about 9/11, in which I think the the kind of um, xenophobia and Islamophobia that resulted from from that event um, can be viewed. And again, Sean and I were talking about this as kind of um, as a way that we've moved uh, in in the wrong direction out of that out of that crisis. So. I am thinking a lot about how the, uh, the current context is presenting these, these, um, these openings where ideas are, are in flux and kind of some of our mindsets are in this tectonic shift kind of a moment. Uh, and so I'm particularly interested in how the, the situation that we are in right now is one in which these ideas um, are being actively negotiated and engaged. And the, the idea is that the way that we position these issues is going to be of incredible consequence in terms of, in terms of where they go and what happens. So I'm really interested in, um, in government and kind of how the current discourse is creating some, uh, some openings and some ways of thinking about government and having conversations about government that four weeks ago, we're really just not a part of our, uh, of our media discourse. We're not a part of the public conversation. Um, I'm really interested in, uh, in race and health equity and how the current situation um, is, is kind of shining a light on, on some of these things that did not have such a powerful light shown on them up until a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm super interested in the idea of artificial intelligence and surveillance and privacy of, of personal data. Um, and how some of the, the discourse around public health interventions and actions are really bringing to light these issues in new ways. Um, I have three children who are at home. I am particularly and acutely um, having conversations with, with my partner and with my parents and with others over the phone, of course, about education and learning and how what's going on right now really presents some, um, some really different ways of uh, for example, appreciating the role and the, the professional nature of teachers and, and uh, remote and digital learning. Um, and I think last but certainly not least, one that I have a firm eye on uh, now and moving forward, I think this is going to be, be an issue that 
uh, the way that we position our messages about is going to be of incredible importance is is around labor uh, work and and the economy. Um, so this is all just to say that uh, there is an immediate importance of how we're communicating about issues uh, in, in a way that I, I hope I'm not being too dramatic, but are kind of life and death consequences. And I don't mean to diminish the importance of those communications whatsoever. Uh, but I also uh, really want to suggest that the decisions that we're making now and how we're waiting in on issues is going to be of incredible consequence moving forward in terms of policies that are or are not made in terms of directions that the public discussion goes or doesn't goes doesn't go in terms of mindsets that are or are not shifted. Um, and I want to end uh, with uh, one of my favorite new quotes about framing and communications and explanations. So this comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a Supreme Court justice in the early 1900s, um, who says that I would not give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And I think that these are some fancy words and some interesting kind of rhetorical structure here, but I think this is, uh, in a nutshell, this is, this is kind of what all of our jobs are these days and moving forward. So with that, I will stop. Um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to stop my share, right? Yeah, if you stop your share, we can okay. see you, my friend. And then we have, oh goodness, 14 questions. And then Susan, Teresa, and Tessa, I don't mean to call you out, gang, but, but if you would put your questions into the Q&A box, we have a little bit of time, uh, and I have learned over the last couple of days, we're all kind of trapped at home. So Nat, do you have a hard stop at three if we went over just a little bit, would that be okay? Okay. Totally so good. Let's get after them then. Let's go ahead and, and ask questions. And, and I'm gonna come back to the conversation we were having, but let's get to the questions our friends have first. Uh, so Rachel asks, oh, by the way, I should tell you all, if you haven't done this before, you can also not only ask questions, but you can vote for questions. So if you see one that someone's asked, you can either add to it or you can vote for it so we know what's most relevant and salient most helpful to the most folks so with that in mind okay amanda just jumped to the top rachel will get to you in a second amanda asks uh risk versus vulnerability how do we talk about how some groups are at higher risk and the inequities that have led to that increased risk without falling into the vulnerability chat and don't mind us everybody tristan's just putting up the, the q a slides so we all know where we're at let me to read that back to you again no, I mean, I risk think I got it. I think vulnerability. Um, how do we talk yeah. about inequities that led to an increased risk without falling into that, that victim or vulnerability? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, I think there is a way of doing it. Um, uh, and a lot of it is about, a lot of framing is about ordering kind of what you lead with and the lens that you establish through which people are going to make sense of your, your information and your issues. And there is a there is a tendency, I have seen a tendency to set that lens as one of vulnerability, that there are particularly vulnerable or, at, I mean, how many times have you heard at risk um, groups? And that is the, that, that kind of the frame that we enter that conversation through. I think there are, um, there are ways of talking, uh, for instance, about beginning with um, kind of that, that, again, not the words targeted universal, but the idea kind of appealing to, to kind of common ideas and processes, but then quickly going into ways that those common processes are differentially affecting particular groups. Um, and I think you can do that without calling those, those groups vulnerable or at risk. Um, I think you can appeal to the need to, to support kind of all Americans, but make it very clear that that means, you know, that, that with some groups, different actions and more and different resources are, are necessary. So, I mean, a lot of this is just about what we, what we, the cues that we begin with. Um, and, and if you analyze, I mean, do this as an exercise, if you've got an extra half an hour in your Friday afternoon, like go back and look at some of these messages and, and just look at how many of them begin with these appeals to, to, to kind of vulnerability in the way that it others or at risk in the way that that others in a way that kind of, this is a fancy word, but essentializes those groups, right? It appeals and kind of reifies these stereotypes that we have of, um, of, of communities living in poverty, of communities of color, of, of whatever uh, group uh, you're talking about. Um, so I, I, that may not be a satisfying answer. I mean, it's a complicated question, but I think there are, there's immediate things that we should probably stop doing. Like right. stop leading with vulnerability, stop leading with at risk. Yeah. Um, 
but you certainly need to talk about how there are some groups in this country that 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 require uh, different and more resources because of the ways that they're being affected. We actually had Doug Hathaway join us yesterday, uh, and he was going through the CDC's crisis communications manual. One of the things he talked about was just the power of aspirational messages yep. and how important that is. And it, it dovetails very much with uh, some of the really important work that Travian Shorters has been doing, which maybe you're familiar with talking yep. about asset framing versus deficit framing. I mean, obviously at risk and vulnerable, those are deficits. Um, I would also argue at the very moment, at this very moment on the planet, we're all vulnerable. Kind of hard to distinguish who's more, I mean, there's obviously people who are having inequities, but that may not be the path to try to find your way to it. Let's get to the next question from our friend Rachel, who asks, uh, I'm curious about the opportunity to educate folks about why and how systems weren't working before this pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and that this is an opportunity not to return to normal, but to fundamentally rethink how we've structured our world. Uh, and that's a, a statement. And I think uh, Sarah asked sort of as an as a addition, yes, how do we hold the line on many more equitable policies being advanced as stop gaps? Yeah, no, I mean, you use the construction, whoever wrote that, um, Rachel, uh, use this construction of kind of what is the normal that we return to? I'm super interested in that as kind of a, um, as an important thing to think about. In these moments of flux, we do have the ability to reshape what the normal is that we emerge into in a in a unique way and i know that's kind of um it's hard to say that in a way that doesn't it's hard to say that and and maintain a focus on the the kind of current crisis and the suffering that that we are in but, but i think that both of those need to be need to be held in mind um, i'm particularly interested in this idea of uh, kind of the lack of preventative systems and i don't just mean in 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 healthcare that we as a country have kind of allowed a lot of the or, or haven't advanced prevention across our systems. Now that could be foster care and child welfare, that's certainly health care. Um, and I think that there is a moment, I do not think it is yet, but there is a moment in which some of those appeals um, will be really important, important to make. Um, there is a danger, I think, when it comes to the, the kind of crisis communications component of this to to move too quickly into some of those systemic critiques in a way that maybe makes our messages sound tone deaf, or as Sean was saying, kind of crowds the space. Um, but I, I, think, I think we're getting there. Um, and I think it will be incredibly important that people make those appeals um, and use the current context as a, as a lens or as an example that, that illustrates some of these, these problems that a lot of us on this call have been working for a long time to advance. Um, and I would just advocate for for doing that in a really careful and thoughtful way and not just and not just rushing in to make those points. Yeah, uh, Rachel just sort of notes as a little addendum here that many people are craving normalcy. If the world was going a thousand miles an hour or 60 miles an hour, we just all collectively ran into a brick wall. What we want is the day before that, maybe, whatever that looked like for you. Um, is that possible? Uh, and, and again, this sort of speaks to, I think the idea of, of Inside of this, and obviously what is a horrific, scary, unsettling, I think you use a great word, unmoored moment with a lot of acceleration happening. Are we ever going to find our way back to normal? And normal may be, if you're picking up a sports page, when's baseball going to start since we didn't get to, to opening day? When is fill in the blank going to come back? Is that even a reason so thing to be talking about? Yeah, I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to use, I'm going to use that as a, as an opportunity to make another point, um, which, which is certainly related. It's not, I'm not gonna use my prerogative as a speaker to take it a, in a totally different direction. But so, so I'm really concerned about the, the need for normalcy in that I think kind of in the weeks or months ahead, there's gonna be a strong desire to go back to normal. And I think that some of these issues that have been brought to light in the current context, people are going to be willing to kind of put those to the side in order to get back to what's what's normal. And I think that part of our job as communicators is to is to not let that happen. Right. There are really important ideas that are that are emerging from this situation around some of those issues that I highlighted, you know, race and health equity or role of government or work and labor that I don't think we can let people's desire to get back to normal um, block our ability to, to make. Uh, and so that's, a, I think, a really big challenge for us going forward. 
and I can kind of already, based on the kind of the, the, um, the emotional kind of the visceralness of what you said, Sean, I think that's a, that's a real challenge. It's really a strong pull for people to go back to normal. And I think that for us, the normal that we want to go back to is not the normal that we had, that we had before. And that's going to take a lot of careful work and that's not going to be quick and that's not going to be one organization do that, doing that. That's going to be a lot of us, I think, pushing some of these ideas that I've talked about kind of consistently forward uh, and in creative and different ways throughout the, the different channels and opportunities that we have as communicators. Yeah, I think uh, for my part, and then we'll get to the next question, this is a, a, a moment of yes and. Of course, many folks want to have what they had that day before this happened uh, in your personal lives or in your organization or all the disruption you've encountered. And the yes and, I sort of think of like 9-11. So if you'll remember, I can't remember, was it a ball game? Was it a baseball game or football game? I guess it must have been baseball that I think the Yankees played a ball game within a couple it's of minutes. The Mets. After, was it the Mets? Okay. Yeah. The ball the game, hit the home run. Yeah. Yeah. And that there was sort of this collective belief that that was actually an important thing for us to do to try to reset. At the same time, it's also entirely true that while the Mets were playing ball, we started developing all of these narratives that would play out now over the last two decades, whether that's, you know, the quick passage of the Patriot Act, what would then become the war in Iraq, uh, the, the creation of a whole new government department, DHS. It's hard to believe, but if you're old enough, you remember there was a time you went to the airport, there was no TSA. Um, all those things happened at the same time that we were trying to return to normal. So I wonder if that's a, something that's maybe in front of us is, is trying to do both of those things that we don't have to just have a, a binary, you know, a singular pass, but there's a binary path before us. We can do walk and chew gum. Um, let's get to Mark's question, uh, who says, I'm intrigued uh, Nat, by your emphasis on em explanation. Uh, what about storytelling? Is that still relevant or is storytelling played out or, or does storytelling play within explanation? Yeah, you're not going to get me to say that storytelling's like played out and we're done with that. Like that, that's that's a fundamental. I mean, people have heard me say this. Like people think in story. Yeah, <laughs> that's not that's not going away. That is a a basic feature feature of our evolved cognition and psychology is that we we make sense of information via story. We remember it. What's called encoding via story. We retrieve it. We pass it via it. So that's that's not going away. But you have to understand. Um, that there's a there's a whole bunch of different ways of telling stories. Um, there are some that some that I actually think fall into a lot of the traps and the problems that I've that I've gone through um, in terms of the the kind of heroic individual story, for example. Uh, all of the stories about um, you know basketball players. I think from my from my hometown team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, Kevin Love was the first one who donated hundred thousand dollars to support uh, people who work at whatever Quicken Loans Arena is called now. Um, like those are stories, but I actually think that those are um, those are not the stories we should be telling because of the way that they they do those things that I said. They let government off the hook. They they present people with the solution being, you know, individuals need to make better decisions or people with money need to need to be charitable, which maybe are part of the solution, but certainly are not are not all of it. Um, government needs to play a role in this. They haven't. They need to be called to task, and we need to kind of put that on rerun and repeat. Um, and one of the things that we do a lot at, at Frameworks is we help people think about what explanatory stories look like. So you can have stories that explain um, how things work. You can have a story that explains the role the government needs to play and makes people smarter about the unique contributions and kind of authority the government has in situations like this. So absolutely story, but I think we have to think very carefully about the, the framing effects that the stories that we tell have in terms of, of how people think and feel and what they do or do not do. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of stories that, that explain. Um, and I know there's lots of people, cause I know who's on the call, um, who, who have, who do that really well. Um, and I think those are, those are the kind of stories we need to be telling. They have people in them. They're not just about kind of disembodied systems, uh, but systems and, and play a role. Okay, next question comes from our friend Allison, and just plus one to everything you said about storytelling, by the way. And, and a shameless plug, storytelling for good is a, uh, something that we build about strategic storytelling, 
I think these things are wedded together. You have to tell effect, use effective framing to build stories, but there are strategic stories we can and will be telling now and in the coming months, something that we all need to be very much mindful of. Allison asks, uh, if you don't touch on it, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Nat, on how uh, or if we should be advancing advocacy around things like broadband access, early childhood education investments at this time. So is this a time to start, because we obviously know the federal government's spending a lot of money or printing a lot of money or whatever the hell it is they're doing. Um, is this a time to be playing advocate at this, at this moment? I mean, this is, so we, we had a, we're kind of in the midst of a staff conversation about this right now. Um, and this is going to be an unpopular answer, but it's, it's, it's a really hard question. It's really complicated. And so like any hard question, the answer is not at either end of the continuum. It's not that we need to kind of, unequivocally and uniformly abstain from communicating about our issues when they are, you know, even when they're brought into the middle of the discourse. It's also not true on the other end of the continuum that we need to be, you know, we need to jump in whenever there is even the inkling of a hook that we can hang our issue on. And I think the, the answer to that question is, is somewhere in that, in that gray middle or medium, is that when our issues do come into the discourse in a, in a central and important way, I think we have the, almost the obligation, I know that's a strong word, but the, the obligation to engage in that discourse in a, in a thoughtful and, and strategic way to try to make sure that um, we come out of this with our issue moving in the right direction and that we don't come out of this with our issue having backslid further um, towards all the places we've tried to move it from over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, so that's a, it's, a, it's an answer without a clear, absolute, it's a question without a clear and absolute answer. Um, and I think we're, we're in the middle there. I, I'm certainly not of the mind that we need to um, completely abstain from engaging in arguments and um, and communications about our issues. But I also believe that as a precondition, our issue needs to be centrally connected to what's going on for us to, to, to kind of wade in and engage. Also, and I think the issues that you just said, Sean, are ones that are pretty centrally um, moving into the discourse. Without a doubt. With, with, yeah. Without a doubt, I would also just suggest that at least the latest data is that not all of America is necessarily where lots of the folks are coming in from around the country. And I'm guessing you could testify to this, at least some of y'all. Not everybody's behaving the way everybody is in Boston and everybody, but most folks in Boston, New York, San Francisco, here in the Washington area where I live uh, and where you live, Nat, um, maybe looks a little bit different than it does in places like Gulfport, Louisiana or Taos, New Mexico or, or certain parts of, of the Rocky Mountain areas of our country. Uh, so just be mindful that, you know, some folks still haven't gotten the single biggest message yet, which is please try to stay home. We're still in kind of phase one of this on some levels. Uh, Peter Loge, our colleague who actually joined us, did a fabulous session. You can find it online uh, about managing in this in this moment, managing remote work and, and some of the lessons he's learned from, from soccer and how that applies to systems thinking in soccer, how that applies to doing your work. He has a question for us, so he's with us. Welcome, Peter. Uh, any thoughts from you, Nat, on conceptual metaphors for this moment? So like war, uh, we've been hearing that a lot from lots of different quarters that we're in a war. Uh, he thinks part of our challenge is that we're having trouble identifying what this is and therefore what to do about it. So what's the proper metaphor and is war it? Yeah, well, I'll do the easy part and say that it's not war. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have the, harder, the, hard, the answer to the harder question, which is what is it? Um, I think, and this is probably because I'm mainly thinking about framing, but I'm, I'm, I kind of do a lot of these seismic shift kind of flux um, tension metaphors. Um, I, I think the, I don't know, there is a piece, I don't, I don't have it under, I don't have it right here, but someone actually wrote something about the problems with war metaphors. Um, if my colleagues at Frameworks have that and can shoot it into the chat, that is, that would be, that would be great. Um, but I think the, the kind of underlying premise of the question is that metaphors matter greatly, right? The metaphors that we choose kind of guide how we think about the issue and also kind of how we think about who's involved in the issue and what the solutions are. Um, and, and I'm, I guess, pretty unequivocally 
not a fan of of war battle metaphors um so that's a i have a i have a clear answer to one part of that question and the harder part of the question which is what is a better conceptual metaphor um i'm not oh just just put the put the link to that article on the the pitfalls of to mix a metaphor the pitfalls of war metaphors um that i think people uh peter you should you should check that out um i won't get into all of the reasons why it's bad but you can read that article it's 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 pretty good uh but i think you know i think metaphors like this emerge kind of on their own which i'm not sure is the best way for them to emerge it'd be great if we could be a little bit more deliberate and intentional which is what framing is all about in kind of crafting and and having some say in what the conceptual metaphor is that emerges as a way to think about um what we're in and i think that's that's clearly going to be really really important as we as we move forward uh so peter if you've got metaphor ideas let's let's talk man all right so uh michelle and i hope i'm i'm pronouncing that properly has a question says most nonprofits that are working in global development already focus on supporting quotes here vulnerable groups even in a normal time uh, should they maintain consistency or should they drastically be shifting the way they're framing their work or doing their messaging hmm i don't i mean as as long as they're not framing it in terms of kind of quote unquote vulnerable groups which i which i actually it's think a lot of is folks a, do right I yeah mean, no no i think there's a, I think anybody there's out, a, but i could probably find a couple websites in the next two minutes and point to like hero graphics with big things we serve vulnerable communities um and all that stuff yeah, I, I mean I, I so again to kind of twist the question to make it more easily answerable for me <laughs> uh, i think i think i think the kind of vulnerability frame is pretty um uniformly problematic um so i was i'm doing an event in a couple of weeks with folks from the perception institute and uh, they do a lot of work on on kind of the problems with vulnerability framing and the way that it reifies stigma and advances stereotypes and kind of keeps us caught in this trap how it's act, how they're actually incredibly inefficacious for individuals in the groups who are being defined as vulnerable so i think that's a really um interesting and important part of this dynamic so I think that there needs to be a continued focus on the groups who have particular needs that are not being met. I, I do not think the frame of vulnerability should be the way in which that, that, um, that objective is achieved. Uh, and I do think, Sean, I think you're right. I think there's a, uh, there's a tendency, I think it's pretty strong in the field of global development to talk about kind of, uh, to kind of use this, this vulnerable um this vulnerable individual vulnerable group frame i mean the um the phrase within communications of, of kind of that kind of messaging of and this is probably crass i'm just going to go for it kind of flies on eyes framing so of showing an individual who is who is it was clearly um suffering and and experiencing poor well-being as a way to get uh, funding and support for global development um, there's a lot of people who have written about that as being um, one of these situations in which it may bring money in the door but kind of the long-term effect that it has in terms of how we think about groups of people and how we think about solutions um, is actually quite toxic yeah and i would just encourage you if, if you find five minutes and nobody can right now so fully know this may not come to pass maybe carrie can toss this into the chat travian shorters gave us a master class on this at comnet last year uh, in all of his he work. wrote a piece on this in that um series in the Chronicle, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really good on that too. I just reread that again. I reread that um, a couple of days ago. That's a really good piece as well. I don't know if y'all yeah. can link to that. Uh, and actually, yeah, that's, we, we, so just a little bit of shameless plugging, uh, Nat and I and the team Frameworks, we collaborated with our friends at Stanford Social Innovation Review, and we uh, did a series of pieces talking about what would it look like to constructively reframe a bunch of issues that many of us are working on. Uh, and so uh, maybe somebody can toss that in the chat, but if you just go SSIR and Frameworks, I think it will pop up for you. It was a really excellent series. Uh, Cindy asks, can you elaborate on the danger of zero sum thinking? Maybe some examples. Uh, I assume it doesn't mean don't wear N95 masks that a healthcare worker can, but if you can give some other examples, it would be useful. So um, I'll think about specific examples, but, um, and I think the, the opposite of it is the kind of interconnection of strength 
kind of a frame. So there is a tendency, uh, I, I, it's almost like a, a human tendency, I would say, based on um, kind of evolutionary psychology that we have of, of very quickly being able to differentiate in and, and out group. Um, and there are frames that, that, that really activate that, that sense of, of othering. Um, and one of the repercussions or effects of that kind of othering is that when we are when we other and we're asked to think about limited resources, we view those resources um, as as kind of limited finite pools, and we use all kinds of metaphors um, in doing that. But as soon as you you think there are two competing groups and there's a limited set of resources, you set up this dynamic in which um, fundamentally any more for you and yours by definition means less for me and mine. Um, and then there's a, obviously there's a whole bunch of kind of policy implications of, of that kind of thinking um, and a whole bunch of toxic effects, I think. So, so we've seen it really powerfully in our work on immigration um, where you have people using a lot of these kind of um, limited pool, finite resource kind of metaphors and where there's this out group that is seen to be getting or taking and what that means is that we are therefore getting less. And so that fixed resource zero sum way of thinking really structures how we think about immigrate, how a lot of people think about immigration policy, which is fundamentally different to a lot of the analysis that social scientists at the National Academy of Science have, has done in terms of the economic impacts of immigration, that it's actually not a, a finite pool fixed resource is actually not how immigration and the economy work. Um, it, at the at the kind of fundamental nature of it, um, but any time you establish that competition over resources, and your goal is to is to is to increase the well being of of certain groups to support certain groups, that decision making becomes really fraught and and problematic. We see this a lot in our work on aging, um, for instance. Uh, a lot in our work on poverty. So my colleague Tamsin Hyatt's on the phone who, who does a lot of work on anti-poverty in the UK. And as soon as that kind of zero sum us and them dynamic is set up between people who are experiencing poverty and, you know, quote unquote, the rest of us, um, it has some really significant policy uh, implications. Yeah, scarcity is not a winning strategy. Uh, Catherine asks, uh, not to be contrarian, uh-oh, <laughs> not to be contrarian, but when nonprofits are trying to make their case for things like funding right now, they need a shorthand, uh, they need to shorthand the impact that their work will have. Funders, so our friends out in Grantland, uh, elected officials and others have vulnerable and at risk firmly set in their vocabularies. It's just the language that they speak. So trying to teach decision makers a new vocabulary that's maybe more asset braced or, or, or aspirational, when the organization needs a decision and needs to show it, it, its work meets the need that the decision maker sees as productive, how do we do that? How do, how do we start to disrupt maybe the lexicon that exists? Yeah, from the uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, not that country. I love that lead in not to be contrarian. That's like, <laughs> I love that. Um, I mean, I think that's really tough. So when you've got a funding stream that is tied to language, like there is language of vulnerable in the funding stream and you need to appeal to that in order to get funds from that stream. I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure if not talking about vulnerability is an option. I mean, I, I get the kind of the, the nuts and bolts pragmatic nature of that. I do think our job is to slowly, if not slowly, is to stop talking about vulnerability outside of those contexts in hopes that over time those funding streams no longer are tied to those words. I mean, I think the things that we do over time shape that context of, of those streams of, of money. I know that's not a right now, here and now kind of answer, but I think that's, that's part of what our obligation is as social issue communicators. Um, hopefully this isn't too shameless of a plug, but our COVID newsletter, uh, the most recent uh, installment came out yesterday and it's all about how nonprofits can frame the, uh, can frame their case, uh, can frame the importance of nonprofits <laughs> in the current context and, and uh, how decisions will be made about um, supporting nonprofits moving forward. So whoever asked that question, I might, that was um, Catherine. You can. Uh, and it's not shameless, I think, to, to point to check, check, check that out. Um, you don't have to sign up for it. You don't have to have it clog your inbox, but 
Um, if you just go to our website, um, it's all of the installments of it are there and you might find the most recent one that came out yesterday particularly helpful. Yeah, and I think the point you made, just to make it really plain, Matt, is, is it, this is the long game on some of these ships. Yeah. Um, I'm reminded many, many years ago, several jobs back, I worked at the Center for American Progress, and one of our projects was to reintroduce the word progressive to the American lexicon in politics and policy circles. And I remember the day we sort of started talking about it, and it was like, good luck with that. Well, guess what? I defy you to look at a newspaper today and not find that word. And maybe it's even something you use to, to identify yourself. Um, but it didn't happen overnight. That work began in 2003. So 17 years later, progressive is, is very much part of the lexicon. Uh, Nick asks, do you advocate framing messages differently on different channels? So would you talk about something one way on social versus a newsletter? Or is the consistent frame approach the way to go? Mm, that's a great uh, great. Does framing matter by platform? Uh, great to... question. Uh, so so uh, yes and no. So uh, just a, a little dorky researchy thing really quick. So this is the one area of communications research that is kind of um, most, that is thinnest. So there's not a lot of work that's been done that looks at the effect of channel on, on framing effect. So the same message through different channels and the different effects that it has. So that's a caveat that everything I'm going to say now is a bit is a bit less evidence and empirically based than most of what I've said here today. So I think the, the, the kind of holy grail in terms of the balance here is that you want to advance common ideas across those channels, but the ways in which you advance them are going to be different by channel. So the way that you articulate, so going back to that um, children's issue graph, the, the kind of future progress, social prosperity. I think the goal in the field of early childhood is to irrespective of what channel you're you're going to almost irrespective of what audience you're speaking to that is an effective value to advance but that doesn't mean that you're going to advance it in kind of a block copy way across different channels and that this is where i think kind of the the profession of communications uh, is really important so to, how do you take a common idea and kind of breathe life into it um, across different channels and two different audiences. So I think it's, that's kind of the balance you're after. So what are the big common ideas, the kind of meta frames that we need to advance across all of our work and then starting to get kind of more tactical and strategic in, in how that meta idea may look different in this channel, that channel to this audience, that audience. So I think it's, it's that kind of balance that you're after. And that allows you to take what we know about how different channels work differently and how different audiences need uh, kind of have different needs, but also to to really leverage this amplification power of of moving common ideas across that variation. Yeah, and I think in practical terms, what that can even look like is if you think about something like an Instagram, which is entirely visual, uh, an aspirational picture on Instagram is going to look quite a bit different than maybe a vulnerability picture. Just to bring that that thread back up. Um, so the way that we display and show off some of these things is, is another way of thinking about how we frame. Um, Rebecca asks, can you talk a little bit more about the environmental effects that we're seeing now and why talking about the fact that, that carbon uh, blooms coming off of Beijing or wherever it may be have diminished substantially, why this is dangerous for progress we could or should be making on climate change? Yeah, that's a, I appreciate that question, which gives me a, <clears throat> a chance to dig into something I kind of glossed over a little bit. So. One of the things, and so my colleague Jess Moyer is also on the phone, who's done a lot of this work that I'm going to talk about right now and works with a lot of um, climate, uh, climate science, climate organizations. And so we know in the work that we've done that there's a really powerful, and again, this is, this is not groundbreaking, um, earth shattering, what I'm about to say is that people have this duality in their minds between climate and the economy, that things cannot be good for both, that if something's good for the, if we want to do good for the economy, we have to be willing to make sacrifices on climate and vice versa. If we want to do things that are beneficial for climate, we have to be willing to kind of put the economy in the backseat and make some sacrifices. And so I think what happens when you point out those uh, kind of that finding or, or that particular message that, um, that Rebecca highlighted is that it, it, it activates and sets up that duality in people's minds where they, where you have just created this, logical conclusion for them that the only way to address climate is to do the kind of full stop on the economy thing that has just happened. And so I think it's that opposition that's really dangerous and unproductive in terms of people's thinking. We do not want people to think 
that the only way to solve climate issues is to shut down the economy. And if that is what, and I, and I think that that is what people walk away from those kind of messages with. Yeah, that's great that, you know, that we see these beneficial effects on the economy, but look at the economic, sorry, these beneficial effects on climate, but look at the economic sacrifices that we had to make to, to make that happen. So if, if, if this is the only way to get that, then I'm not in. And I think that's the, that's the kind of takeaway that people have from those, from those communications. And N of one, um, I've had a conversation with at least one person uh, uh, who, who really strongly walked away from those kind of messages with that as a takeaway. Uh, but that's based on a, the basis of that is, is work that's larger than an N of one. All right, going to our next question, our friend Sarah asks, uh, ditto on storytelling. How should one balance the need for heroes and villains without falling into the zero sum trap that you'd mentioned? So, so you, you need, you need heroes and villains. You need good guys and bad guys. A story without either one is almost not a story. So that may not strictly be true, but it's, it's not a good story. Um, I think, Part, part of what we advocate is that um, heroes and villains need not be people all the time. So systems and resources and policies, this is, sounds wonky, I know, but those, those can be actors in stories. So there's a way in which solving a problem can be a group of people or a, a service or a program uh, that intervenes and remediates the situation kind of fixes the outcome it does not always need to need to be that a a person gaining grit gumption willpower drive and making better decisions is the thing that leads to what is another definition of story kind of a change in in status over time and so we try to think really hard about after people hear a story, what are they taking away as the thing that led to the change in outcome? And the thing you wanna watch out for is that you do not want people to walk away from a story thinking that the thing that changed the situation was an individual and their acts and their heroic acts, right? You want it to be clear that either that was a group of people or it was some system, some set of resources, some action other than, than grit that led to that change in outcome. Um, so I would just push people to think about, yes, there needs to be good guys and bad guys, but they need not be guys, they need not be individuals that are, that are playing those roles. And then we have access to a wider cast of, of characters when we do that. Our friend Neha uh, writes in and says, uh, I've heard from health experts that public attitudes about this virus need to be shifted to acknowledge the magnitude of sacrifice that will be required from all of us to get through this and through the second round that's likely to hit us come this fall. How can we do that, particularly if sacrifice framing isn't usually successful with audiences? I think so. So the, the, that's a great question. Um, these are all- Can I just question the premise really of that? Good. Britain just activated 750. Britain has a standing army now that is quadruple the size of their actual army. Go, not to go back to the war metaphor, but they, they created a volunteer, uh, like they're calling it an army of folks who made themselves available, do everything from like driving uh, taxi drivers, driving a, a healthcare workers home after a shift in the hospital. Um, 750 Brits turned, uh, 750,000, excuse me, got it wrong by a factor of a lot. Uh, 750,000 Brits have signed up to do that. So uh, I just wonder, thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the, the, the problem with sacrifice is, this, is the kind of savior victimness of it, that we are sacrificing for them. And I think that it, that dimension is really, um, is really part, of the, part of the problem of that. And I, I think there are ways of, of framing for difficult but necessary collective action that don't fall into those us and them zero sum kind of ways of, um, ways of appealing people. So going back to the UK, uh, we've found that, um, and again, this is on children's issues in particular, but appealing to a sense of social responsibility is, in, is incredibly powerful in getting people to be more supportive of difficult public action. Um, now, 
I'm not sure if social responsibility is as um, as resonant and powerful here in the US as it is in the UK, to be a little snarky for a second. Um, but I do think that there are ways of appealing to responsibility. There are ways of framing kind of collective and common good that allow people to, um, to be open to, to difficult tasks. Um, I, I, so Miha, my, my response to that is I think there's a way of making those calls without, certainly without falling into the kind of um, sacrifice or kind of savior victim sacrifice frame. But I'm also not sure if, if sacrifice is a necessary dimension of that argument. I think there are ways of having that argument that are not about sacrifice. Yeah, and, and I would just add, and maybe Carrie can toss this in, Doug Hathaway just wrote something for us based on the CDC's crisis communications manual about aspirational. So trying to help people see themselves as their best selves is maybe less yeah. about sacrifice and more about what kind of person do you aspire to be? Who do you think yeah. you are in your heart of hearts? And maybe that's the way to think about it. The action may be sacrifice, but the, but the yeah, approach and a, attitude is much more aspirational as opposed to I'm going to go without that scarcity idea that sacrifice implies. I think um, that's a really important point, Sean. So it may be that, so Niha, it may be that sacrifice is actually what needs to happen, but it may, it may also be that talking about sacrifice is not the best way to get that to happen, right? So a difference between the kind of social analysis and the communications analysis. Uh, our friend Jasper writes in from West Virginia, hope you're doing well, my friend, says, uh, you may want to address the research on empathy for framing. So communicators should also keep empathy in mind in framing. Framing is issue through telling, uh, of framing an issue through telling the powerful individual story of one affected person is much more affected, effective rather, excuse me, than any statistics. So it's give people data, watch them go to sleep, tell them a story, watch them come to life. Yeah, there's like a whole a whole another webinar. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah, like yeah, a yeah. series I, of I'll webinars. You two have around. like a, a super deep geek tickle fight offline. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's 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 parts of that that I'm like totally that are inarguable uh, empirically, and then there's parts of that that I um, that I push on a little bit. Um, but I think that's a that's like a longer uh, conversation that I'm Jasper. If you'd like to have that offline, I'd more than more than happy to do that um i think you're i think there's a way of threading that needle that's that's really important okay our friend kate has a question uh and she goes back to the word you may have used it here i know we used it when we were talking before we got online kate asks can we reframe uncertainty as a moment of flux or is there another phrase to use that makes it seem survivable and maybe something will actually bring out the best in us I don't have the answer here. I mean, I, I, I agree with that statement. Like this is an uncertain moment. I, I can just tell you kind of personally in the conversations that I've had, I talk about flux and kind of things being unstable or things being shifting. And again, anecdotally, that tends to be, that tends to get people to a place where they can see kind of a fork or a split. Like it could be, it could be really a bad, it could go in a really bad direction. I think that's a definite possibility, but there is a way in which um, kind of moments of uncertainty or flux or instability or shifting, or the other thing that I talk about is openings, right? It's an opening. Opening is a neutral word. Could be that we go through an opening in a place we don't want to get to. It could be that we go and get closer to where we want to be. Um, but I think we, we need to have an eye out for more of these neutral words and certainly be careful of things like um, opportunity, silver lining, which, um, which I do think, and I'm not saying that the, the person who asked this question was saying this, but I think those are things that, um, that sound off um, and are probably not um, doing proper justice to the difficulty of the current situation. Yeah, one of the words um, that I've heard that, that resonates for me, uh, and you can just Google it, you'll find a bazillion Harvard Business Review articles on this, is the word ambiguity. Because it's not necessarily, it's, it's, it's descriptive and yet out of ambiguity, what do people want? Clarity and opportunity to take action, right? Or sometimes you need to take action through ambiguity in the midst of ambiguity. And that, that may be one way to think about this is that they're, they're certainly just based on what we don't know, which is so much, we are in rather ambiguous circumstance. 
Um, JC asks, what framing recommendations would you have around funding for public health? Ooh, this is a good one. I can get me off on my Pentagon for health thing. Uh, what messages do you feel would best overcome the current noise and resonate with policymakers to move them to make funding a priority for state and local public health agencies? Oh man. I, so we've, um, we've got a, a, a project that we've conceptualized over the last couple of weeks and our Kind of trying to get funded and are shopping around that would generate the answer to that question um, as well as a number of these kind of opening flux how do we talk now to, to try to make sure or to increase the probability that we move out of this in the right direction um, that's one where I just I don't know if I have good enough ideas to to, to roll out there um, I do think that that's one where um, where we have to be really careful and I'm not sure if the timing is quite right to make that kind of an ask or an argument right now. Um, but I think there certainly is a way that if uh, that we that we will emerge from this kind of pointy part of the crisis with this as a as an example or as an exemplar that the field of public health can use in really powerful ways to to make the case for um, for, for different funding and for different policies going forward. Um, and we have a lot of uh, public health partners, the DeBeaumont Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who um, are, are asking that same question and I think are, are beginning to think about um, some research that would allow us to have some empirically based rather than kind of armchair pontification uh, answers to that question. So that's, that's a long way of, I guess, pleading the, the fifth on that one. Um, I'm not sure that I can be helpful enough to to suggest something on that one. That is a super Sean. I don't know if you've got I if you've got I, I, any ideas, but it's a great it's a great question, and it needs to happen. Like this yeah. is a that is a major opening, right? I think it's happening. I actually think it's happening. I think one of the, this is total speculation. I have got no data to support this. I will point to one piece of data, which I you know just read in the paper. So take it with a, a absolute giant grain of salt. Um, a lot of hospitals right now are financially struggling, despite the fact that they are busting at the seams or in my sister's hospital, as an example, they're just, they're at an overcapacity. And the reason is because elective surgeries got shut down almost overnight and almost across the country. Elective surgeries turns out is a major moneymaker for most hospitals. Um, and because they're not doing things like, oh goodness, I don't know, tummy tucks or whatever it is that, that would count as an elective surgery. Um, they are not having a big income stream that they need. I actually think one of the outcomes that could come from all of this, much like 9-11 gave rise to the creation of a whole new government department, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and all of the attended monies that's been spent there and the, and the sort of clustering of government agencies like uh, uh, Border Patrol or the creation of TSA and these other things. I would not surprise me at all if one of the outcomes from all of this is that we start to see health as a national security issue. I know in the Pentagon they do. They've actually... I know we're not following any of these, but there are in fact plans on how to deal with the pandemic um, and they run exercises on this. But it would not surprise me at all if we come to see that absent a foreign army stepping on American soil, the, the, the rapid halt and unimaginable economic destruction that this thing has raised uh, was the equivalent of, uh, of an act of war. And I want to step away from that metaphor, but, but that you may end up seeing something like a Pentagon for Health emerge. Uh, where you take, again, some existing entities and start clustering them together and thinking about funding them really, really differently. Um, whether that's going to come to pass, who knows, but those are the kinds of narratives that will emerge. And then we tend to tell ourselves, you know, these narratives emerge, then we tell stories, it becomes conventional wisdom, and then we make investments as a consequence. Uh, so I will say, I, so that's what I, go ahead, I, sorry. I think that there, so I, I just, the, my concern is that what I'm about to say may not be super contextually sensitive to what we're in right now, but frameworks has done a lot of work in how to frame the value of public health. So there's a major project um, that was funded by the De Beaumont Foundation that has a set of recommendations that are on our, that's on our, that are on our website um, about how to, how to do what you just asked JC, but not, it was done before the current situation. So my hesitance is, um, is in thinking about whether those recommendations are, are kind of a best optimal fit for the now. I mean, I think that they, they probably would continue to be effective and important, um, but I would just offer them with that, with that one caveat, is that they are based on about two years of research 
that concluded about nine months ago. Um, but I think that those are those are valuable tools. And in the absence of of new empirical uh, research and evidence, that may be a good place to to go back to. Yeah, and I would just add uh, some context. We, this is blindingly obvious to everybody, but we are in an election year. Uh, I have no crystal ball, but I would not be even remotely surprised to start seeing campaign ads several months from now when we're past this pointy moment that, that you put so beautifully, uh, where people start to talk about the bill they put forward or the investments they've made. Um, th this is going to get political pretty quickly, unfortunately. Our friend Jennifer asks, uh, I love this quote from a recent article in the Financial Times, the pandemic is a portal. Uh, in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And then she adds, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through it lightly with little baggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Uh, thoughts and reactions there. Think well, I, I think I think framing is the key to the portal. It's a totally mixed metaphor there, right? No, no, um, we have the key, right? Yeah, right. I, door, I, right? I, I have not I have not heard that one. I think that's really interesting. Um, Jennifer, if you toss that, that in the chat or yeah, maybe it's a dad so he can find it, but that would be awesome. That, that would be great. Um, and I'm sure, so the article that I, I feel like I was thinking about a lot of this stuff and then someone wrote an article about it yesterday and it kind of brought together a lot of my thinking. I'm sure that a lot of people on the call have read the, the piece from the editorial staff at the New York Times called The America We Need, which was released yesterday. If people haven't read that, the kind of questions that people are asking and Jennifer, kind of the particular thing that you're interested in, there's a lot of you know, interesting, um, I would say, largely depressing ideas that are that are in that piece i'm hoping the second one in their series is a bit more uplifting than than the first one but i think it's a it's a really important piece of writing and it's got a lot of lot of good important ideas in it uh anik asks and she's coming to us from miami hope everybody down there is good and well it says frameworks offer so many examples of great framing how do you feel about organizations using these examples in our work? Is the idea that repetition is best, so copying your frames is encouraged, or is it a bad idea to take something off the shelf and just use it if it isn't meant for you? If it's that not is the problem. idea. That is the idea. So the, the, our mission <laughs> as a nonprofit is to do work and make recommendations so that people pick them up and use them as frequently and, and widely and with as much kind of coherence and collaboration as possible, coordination and collaboration as possible. So, I mean, everything that I've said here, everything that I've, that, that's on the website, the idea is like, take it, learn from it, use it. Um, you know, I think the, the best way to use the work is to take it, to learn it, and then to, to kind of use your skills as a communicator to make it, to make it better, to make it your own, to make it authentic and resonant with, with whatever groups of people you're, you're communicating with. So, without a doubt um steal like this it's not even stealing like this is this is here for everybody that's on the call that's that's totally the idea that's the only way that it works yeah what's the old reagan line uh you know you have to the yeah. minute you get sick of saying it is the first time that they hear it yeah. and as a ton of science i don't know if it's actually the 20 times but you need to hear something 20 times multiple multiples of times uh, in order for it to even start to kind of get some purchase within your brain. Uh, our friend Michael is coming in from Nebraska and he says, regarding going back to normal, so taking the conversation back a little bit. By the way, can I just say how psyched I am, how many of you guys are super nerds and hanging out with us? Because we've been doing this for 90 minutes. I hope we're not killing Nat in the process or Carrie who's taking great notes, but but I am just amazed. There's hundreds of us or over a hundred of us on this call right now, which is pretty cool, darn cool. Um, so go us for being super nerds and geeks together. Uh, Michael asks, regarding going back to normal, in Nebraska's early childhood world, we are trying to use a different frame, one that seemed to work after the devastating spring floods that hurt our state last year. So going back to 2019, it was called Build Back Better. Do you think Build Back Better is a better or useful frame? You're nodding. Yes, I do. I'm just writing it down because I think it's that useful. Um, I do, and I really kind of, we could cut it up in terms of why I like it, but 
Um, first of all, so we've done a lot of work. I'm sorry, who was the? Uh, Michael person? Burke, who I think is with Michael. the Early Childhood Institute. Okay. Michael, um, thank you very much. So you, you probably know this, but um, Frameworks has done a lot of work on early childhood, a lot of uh, kind of metaphor work over the last 24 years. And one of the, the, the most help, I think one of the most helpful pieces that has come out of that work is this idea of brain architecture, that brains are built and we can get into all of the reasons why that's, um, that's helpful. Um, but first of all, your phrase has that kind of construction, pun intended, Kind of built into it right so it's about an active process of of building um and that can be applied in a, in a very specific developmental way uh, and i also think there's a really strong sense of kind of efficacy we talked about efficacy in the presentation there's a sense that this is about a solution that and it gives you through its tone kind of a conception that a a better solution or a better thing is possible so it has it has kind of an effective metaphorical construct in it it's very pragmatic, and I do think Sean's used the word used the word aspirational or aspiration at least four times. Um, I think I think Michael, I think what you just said is that. Um, so I I like that idea. I think I'm also um, I believe strongly that uh, kind of having a tag is important, but more important is what you what you put around it. Um, so I think about kind of the what comes after and around that as being really important, kind of how you how you use that as an opening and then move through it in a in a careful and effective way. Nancy has a good question. I'm curious to see how you tee up on this one. She asks, uh, how does the information that you've shared reconcile with traditional change management process, which, and she says this parenthetically, which seems to have evidence that it works. Um, so that, it, and, and in change management, it's always leading with painting a dire picture of the problem in order to create urgency and inspire an action. Cool. I just, I don't know if I know enough about uh, change management as maybe as my staff members who are on the line can attest. Um, I, I mean, I, I would just, there, there's really solid communications research that would suggest that that's like part of it. I mean, there, there is a, a message without that urgency doesn't grip. It doesn't. It doesn't get people to to stop, pause, think, and and consider. But and I would think this would have to be true in change management as well. That if if that's all you ever do, very quickly people run into kind of emergency inflation and crisis fatigue. And if you give me dire and on fire to the degree that we hear it, almost immediately when I hear it. I disengage. So there has to be some kind of a solution or an efficacy component that follows quickly upon those um, kind of appeals to to urgency and and importance and and gravity of a situation. So, so I guess I'm agreeing with that. Yes, I think that's important. And then I'm saying, but I think you have to have an equally strong sense of of solutions of efficacy. Um, of the kind of sense that you get from, for example, from that Build Back Better uh, line that Michael shared with us. Okay, next question comes from, and this is horrible because uh, my Irish father will bought me upside the head for messing this up, but Fanula, I believe, Sweeney asks, post COVID-19 and what will it look like is a question in itself. How can this community, how can this community galvanize to speak with one voice for greater impact and how will we know when the right time is to do that so we can be heard without disappearing into a cloud of other organizations or businesses agendas. So I think she's, I don't mean to paraphrase here, but I think the question is, when can we pivot to phase two or phase three or wherever we are, we are starting to address some of these narrative changes that are almost certainly, they're already happening. Uh, but that we can be, to your point, very, very intentional about how we're framing these so that we can be effective and see changes emerge that we think are constructive and productive as opposed to some of the maybe destructive ideas that we know we're circulating right now. I mean, I think it's now. I just think it's, it matters how you do it. So the evolution is not like on, it's not like off on. It's an evolution of the way that you do it, kind of the explicitness of it, of how far you lean, how tight of a tie-in you need. Um, so I, I mean, I think the time, I mean, these narratives around some of these issues that I've talked about, government or uh, surveillance or criminal justice, which we haven't talked about, those are, those are being formed now. Um, and I think the obligation is to, is to step into them in ways that are sensitive to the, to, the, to the current suffering and horrible stuff that's going on. 
but I don't think the answer is to is to wait for like a month or two months from now and then all of a sudden switch on. I think that the way that you engage with them now is going to be different than the way that you engage with them in, in two months. Um, but I mean, I, I think that time is now. I think that time was two weeks ago. Um, but I think it's, it's, I cannot overstate the importance of the how you do it. Yeah, I am struck that, again, we talked about this, the 9-11 narratives, the three that I can kind of pull out that were really powerful were around safety and security and othering. And I would say all three of those are probably in play right now. Uh, and the question is, how do you frame them? Because if you think about safety, you could probably point to certain news outlets or individuals within our, our, our culture or, or our political space who are talking about safety and security from a very different perspective than maybe others might be. People maybe on this call doing different kinds of work and the, and the othering piece we have seen um, right now seems to be pretty xenophobic and, and, and scary, uh, which you referenced way up at the top of the call, but, but, but may uh, over time come to look like haves and have nots, more of an othering around economics, which I think is, is something that uh, is, is also ever present and will become only more pronounced in the coming days and weeks. I don't know if I had a question in there. It was more just me kind of riffing for you. Um, let's go to another question. Ah, Cindy has a great question. Maybe you have something at Ready Recall. Uh, can you mention some examples of who's doing stories that explain really, really well? Is there any organizations that you would point to and go, yeah, that's a perfect example or a couple of them? Yeah, so my, uh, my favorite one, and I'm not going to, I don't know if, again, if my colleagues can link to this, but we're, we're involved. Um, I know Sean Adamek is on this. I saw the other Sean. There's probably more than two Shans, but the other Sean who I talked to. Sean Connery. That was one of my moms, <laughs> yeah, but I'm pretty sure. Um, is, is part of this work. Um, it's part of the partnership uh, for the future of learning. It's a project called Shared Story, which is a unique, awesome mashup between uh, framing communications researchers, community organizers, and people who make kind of media, people, people who produce and, and make stories. Um, and there's a fantastic, I think it's an eight minute piece that came out of that group called Kings and Queens. It's about uh, community schools in a neighborhood in Chicago. And it is, um, it is my favorite example of an explanatory story that has really engaging individuals as, as their actors, but it does kind of that wonky thing that I talked about before where the, where like the system is an actor in that story. Um, so if we're able to, if someone is able to find that and link to it, I would suggest like that's the, that is a fantastic example, eight minutes. Um, I share that with audiences. I've kind of done a two minute clip of it, the first two minutes, I think, where um, it is a, it's a emotional, riveting, gripping story. It is highly explanatory, right? Like, so it makes me smarter about community schools and closures. Um, and you cannot walk out of that story. You cannot leave that story thinking that um, it, is the, it is the person's fault or it is the person's responsibility to solve it, right? It's clearly kind of a collective public sense of, of responsibility and solutions. We have a number of more questions, but we've been at this for goodness. Uh, I'm doing math. Uh, duh, 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 we're about 105 minutes, something like that, which is a long time. So it's 3.45. Why don't we, uh, I'm going <laughs> to put you on the spot since Friday afternoon. I know you have some little people and probably a partner who is seriously interested in, in a little bit of your attention. Um, or to tap in or tap out, as the case may be. I know my wife is probably. More of, more of that. Yeah. More of that. Um, and the dog is in need of a walk. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just say thank you very much to Nat. We're going to call it uh, time now. Uh, he's available on Twitter if you want to reach him. And of course, uh, uh, Frameworks, they're not shy, so you can find them on the web uh, as well. I'm sure he would be more than happy to uh, chat with you while he's managing life, which for all of us is significantly more complicated than maybe it was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you all have a, a lovely, lovely weekend. Everybody is, is safe and healthy and well and remains that way. Uh, as, a, as a parent, maybe I'll tell this to you, Nat, if you haven't seen it, uh, John Krasinski, uh, the guy from The Office, or I guess the new Jack Ryan, or, ever we want, or, or, or Mr. Mary Poppins, however you want to think of him, 
uh, did an amazing thing with the cast of Hamilton. So if you Google John Krasinski mm. and Hamilton, you've got a solid of eight to nine to maybe 10 minutes of entertainment for your little people. Uh, fair warning, it's the shot, I think it's the opening song from, from Hamilton. So there's some not quite safe for four year olds words in there, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, everybody else be well. Thank you, Nat. I'll talk to you again soon, my friend. Uh, always grateful for your time and grateful to everybody uh, for coming in and, and hanging out and, and, and getting a little bit into the geek end with us. So be well, everyone. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Tristan. Adios, everybody. Have a good Bye. one.